turn your hand like this and put two fingers there. You could make that culprit fairy. You've got it, Alan, very good. And off he went to sail to find the jewels of the queen and the stork of the bull and the hair of the bear that has no hair. <laughs> well, he sailed out into the Hudson and soon he was besieged. Blue snapping crabs appeared. Could you give a few snaps there? Well, he took that sword and yah, 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 jabbed and fought them back. Oh, it was a terrible battle. But all that movement caught the attention of the queen of the Hudson. The queen, of course, is an enormous sturgeon. Why, three times the size of me. And she looks rather like an ancient dinosaur with scales down her sides and a big overlapping mouth and huge bulbous eyes. And those eyes caught hold of the little fairy in that little oyster boat and she thought, a tail is still a morsel, a little dragon, but I will eat him. You got it. Alan didn't even try to talk like that. Well, the enormous sturgeon lifted herself up out of the water, and the wave she caused pushed the culprit fairy high into the air above the Hudson, and he flew out of his little shell, and he kicked his feet, unable to fly without his wings, and the queen caught sight of him and opened her mouth wider and wider and wider. It seemed she could swallow the moon, but the culprit fairy took his wasp sting and planted it right on the queen's lip and vaulted over and away from harm, and the great sturgeon splashed with an echoing slap across the river. Let's make it. I'll slap and you slap back. That's how it sounded. And there rose from the waters of the Hudson. Make your fingers rise like sparkling water. <coughs> Spray from the splash, and they caught the beams from the sun and held those beams like jewels. The culprit fairy doffed his acorn cap and stuffed some of those jewels therein and put that acorn cap back on his head, fell into the Hudson, swam to his little boat, and eventually made his way to the shore of the Storm King, just above the village of Cold Spring. And then he got washed across to a place now called Bull Hill, where up top rested a renegade bull who had broken out of old man Davenport's lot, and now it roamed around wantonly wild in the highlands. It had grown great and shaggy, and so big was it everyone made those bull horns, that all of you could sit on the back of that bull, and there'd still be room for more to fit. And now and then, especially at dawn, that bull would give a great echoing snort. It would go, Snort! And that's what the culprit fairy needed. Now we sat on our chestnuts and wondered, how am I going to get up this great mountain? There appeared a squirrel, hungry for that chestnut. The culprit fairy said, I'll give you this chestnut. If you bring me up to Cloud Rest, where I can meet the bull, the bull hill. The squirrel agreed and took the chestnut, ate it, and after many a day of climbing, arrived at long and at last at Cloud Rest. Why, on a day like today, you could see all the way to New York City. But the culprit saw the great sleeping bull. He poked it with the wasp sting to try to force it to go snort. The bull, so thick-skinned, didn't feel the wasp stinger. He poked and he jabbed and he stung, but the bull, it wouldn't move, wouldn't buzz. Then the squirrel said, tell the bull a joke. A joke? I only know one and it's not very good. Tell it, tell it. And so the culprit fairy whispered into the ear of the bull, what do you get? when you pour hot water into a rabbit hole. Anyone guess? Hot cross bunny. That's what you guys are going to say, right? <laughs> Maybe you can come up with a better one for me next time. Well, the bull thought it good enough, and 
it, Dave? A report of a snort. Everyone put some bullhorns on and say, Snort! But doffing his cap, he scooped up that snort and kept in the jewels and made his way down the mountain with two of the three things needed to complete his quest and get back those four wings. And the culprit fairy then in that oyster shell floated along Hudson's River back and forth and forth and back until at long and at last it came upon Bear Mountain and this was before the bridge Andy sang about. This was when Bear Mountain was indeed stripped bare. All the trees cut down to fuel the foundry at West Point. West Point Foundry, that is, in Cold Spring, and to fuel the new coming steamboats. Toot, toot! There's Static Dave on Bear Mountain, and the culprit went right up to it and called at the entrance, Hello! Is there a bear bear in there? And the bear answered, No! Go away! <laughs> but you're in there, and I want to help! You can't! Come on out and I'll help you! But I am fair! I have no hair! Even John Funk has more hair than me! <laughs> Wait till dark. But when darkness fell over the highlands, thick and vast and full of stars, the bear comes out. You're going to help me? Yes. Now above the cave stood a lone pine. The lovers have not been able to chop. The culprit said, rub up against this tree, bear that has no hair, and you'll see. The bear then rubbed against the tree, and it rubbed 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 until the bark began to open and the sap began to flow, and the bear got all covered with sap. And while it rubbed, it caused the pine needles to fall like rain, and they stuck to that sappy bear. And the bear, though it was green and kind of needly, had, well, or what had been a hairless bear, was now hair. Oh, not bad. Thank you. Would you give me a few um, little blades of needles? I need a few of your hairs. And the bear plucked out a few of those needles and gave them to the culprit bear, who stuck them into his acorn cap. He got back into his oyster shell boat and returned to Crow Nest Mountain. The fairies pounded on the hollow logs, and they all returned. The old king came up out of the ground, pulling his moss beard and scratching his fern hair. Why am I pulled out of the... Culprit, have you completed your quest? I have indeed. And then he doffed his hat, and out there sparkled the queen's jewels. All the fairy folk gathered them up and adorned themselves with those jewels. And then they heard snores. And the king took a little lantern and he kindled it with light from the beam of the moon and gave it to the culprit fairy and at once the four wings appeared on his back and the fairies jumped and danced and had a little celebration. I think it kind of went like this. It's a little celebratory music, I'm sure. <laughs> they all danced around and about. Save for one, a culprit fairy who sat sad and gloomy. The king knew what to do. He cast a spell upon that fairy who fell asleep, and when he awoke, he was human. He dove into the Hudson and swam across. And this is of the days of the height of the West Point Foundry. And the Civil War was a brew. Then he got a job there, yea, it's true. And when he earned enough money to buy a fine fancy set of clothes, he went down to the river at Cold Spring and awaited that sloop with the daughter he so loved of that skipper. And then he presented himself and whispered more bits of poetry and sang songs almost as sweet as the one Andy plays. And he proved kind and loyal and true. And eventually, he married that sloop skipper's daughter. And they had children who had children who had children who had children who still live round and about in our Phillipstown. And you may know them by a kind of a 
impishness they have about them, and some say they even have slightly pointed ears. And I happen to know one of them is our town supervisor, Mr. Richard Shea. <laughs> that does explain quite a bit, wouldn't you say? <laughs> Tell him I told you so next time you see him. And my friends, you see, you've now been able to listen to a fairy tale from our Hudson River Highlands, the culprit fairy. Thank you very much for indulging me in this. Thanks too to Andy Redkin for playing this.